But think back to World War II. What we saw in World War II is that the people who were hell-bent on murdering the Jewish people in Europe were very bad for all of us. You see, this is, this is the thing that really, people really need to understand. The Nazis were very bad for all of us. I'm not Jewish. And people ask me, well, why, would you, why are you expending so much energy defending the Jews? You're not even Jewish. And I'm like, this is not an act of charity. I'm, I'm defending myself. This is self-defense. This is Western self-defense. Anti-Semitism is, is a danger to the West. We saw it in World War II. So the anti-Semites, the people that wanted to kill all of the Jews, what did they do? They, they plunged us into a world war. The entire planet was sucked into their war. The anti-Semites are very bad for us. Very, very bad for us. All of us, whether Jewish or not. Hello, everyone. And welcome to this very special edition of Through Conversations podcast, a podcast dedicated to exploring the truth through conversations with the most brilliant minds. I can't think of anyone who's trying to explore that truth and find that truth and share that truth with us than Francisco Hill White. Francisco Hill White is an anthropologist, a historian and a political scientist, and he's the creator of the popular newsletter and online course, Management of Reality where he's building a system of articles and historical and investigative research covering topics in politics, foreign affairs, corruption, the fight for democracy, and more. And he's been diving, doing a deep dive into what's happening with the Israeli-Palestinian war. And so he's going to share a truth, some re starking truths about that conflict with us. So Francisco, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm honored and I'm excited and I'm a bit fearful about what you're going to share with us today because it might break the internet. Your, your, your research is one that really has <laughs> blown my mind. But before we get to all of that, could you share with us some bits of your trajectory, a pivotal moment or a turning point in your life that led you to pursue the path you're on today, Francisco? I think the turning point... There, of course, there have been many turning points, like there have been for many people, but the one that put me on the specific path I'm on today, I think there were two. So one was 9-11. When 9-11 happened, I, it was a very big shock to my system. And it made me realize that I needed to rethink my model of the news media because the thing that was very, very shocking to me after the initial shock of, of the attacks themselves was that the media was behaving in a way that seemed to me more consistent with the Soviet Union than with the United States and, and, and Europe that, that I had in my mind. So I used to believe that the United States was a shining example of democracy. I had been having my doubts, uh, this is true, in the years prior to 9-11, because I had been looking more and more at the history of U.S. foreign policy. And as I did that, it seemed to me that that history was not really consistent with the promotion of democracy. Uh, so I had been having my doubts. But when 9-11 happened and I, and I saw the media not investigate anything because they didn't, they were not interested in finding anything out. They were just repeating what the government said. And they would all, you know, put their American flags on their lapels and Bush, Bush, rah, 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 uh, everything Bush, good. Uh, when even in the most innocent explanation, uh, there should have been a, 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 just a storm of condemnation because the, even even the most innocent explanation means that the U.S. government cannot protect its citizens, right? Mm. So all kinds of people should have been fired. There should have been very strong criticism of the government, investigations to find out what happened, blah, blah, blah. But the media was not behaving like that at all. They were all cheering for the U.S. government. Um, so I thought, well, this is very strange. And so that's when I began investigating, just looking around, investigating is a very big word. I, I began reading uh, alternative journalism because that was the time when the uh, blog revolution was taking place, right? So, so the 
everybody was putting up their own websites and blogs and, and doing citizen journalism. This was the big f first flourishing of citizen journalism was happening right at that time. So I started looking to see if any alternative journalists with their own blogs were actually doing research that was consistent with with a, a free press because the, the major media were not doing that. And I found some very interesting people. Uh, and uh, uh, f first among them, Jared Israel, who was doing just first rate work uh, on a website that was called Emperor's, The Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, and, and that work uh, opened my eyes to many, many things that I, I, I was beginning to suspect, but that I, I had a very poor handle on. And he had an enormous amount of research uh, that I, I dived into and started learning from. Uh, and that was, that was the beginning. Then I ended up working with him for a few years. Um, and it, it was a tremendous education for me. I learned a lot from him. Um, so that was the big turning point. And then the second turning point was when, uh, it, more specifically about the Arab-Israeli conflict, was when uh, in 2003, Israel was accused of committing a massacre in Jenin. Uh, so most of, most of your listeners will not even remember this, but uh, Israel was accused of committing a massacre in the so-called UN refugee camp of Jenin. It's, 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 it's really a town, I mean, but they still call it a refugee camp. Um, and Jared and I looked at it, and in no time we realized that there had been no massacre. Uh, he, he was the first one to think there was something fishy about the accusation, and, and we looked into it, and sure enough, uh, there had been no massacre, but it, everybody was accusing massacre. Uh, eventually, they had to retract it, but the, you know the retraction was in very small print, uh, and the back pages, blah blah blah. You know, it's not. They never make these retractions on the front page or prime time, uh, so the accusations linger, uh, and that's when I became became very interested in trying to understand better what was happening with the Arab-Israeli conflict and with the media representation of the conflict. Uh, so that's when I dove into the history of of Zionism, the history of the uh, Arab-Palestinian movement, uh, and I've been doing a lot of research on that topic ever since. Wow, Francisco, that's a, that's a trajectory, and that those are two turning po points that are very, very shocking, and I have two questions. I have two pivots here that I myself want to do, but the first one is regarding your trajectory. I know that you were on track for tenure in UPenn. And if you're comfortable with our with 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 me and with your with my audience, uh, would you like to share why did you pen shut down your your track to tenure and what was this true that you you somehow uh, found that not other people were talking about? Well, actually, that's an excellent segue from what I was just saying because when I when I started getting very interested in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, uh, one of the, the the thing, and this is the other turning point, I guess. Uh, I found I should make clear I'm not the first one to find this. It's not it's not a, a, an original discovery of mine. I mean, I, I just I went into the library and started looking up stuff on the history of the Arab Palestinian conflict, yeah. and I, I, I discovered that all of this was already documented. It was it was all in the library. Uh, the Arab Palestinian movement was created by the same people who carried out the Nazi extermination of the European Jews during World War II. The founding father of the Arab Palestinian movement is this guy called uh, Haj Amin al Husseini, uh, who was very, very extremely famous, world famous uh, in the first half of the 20th century, and, and even still immediately after the war. Uh, certainly, very famous. Uh, but now in the West, and in the West, he was famous in the West, uh, as well as the Muslim world. Uh, but now, after World War II, a few years after World War II, the media started stopped talking about him. They just dropped the subject of Husseini completely. And after a few decades in the West, nobody could remember him, uh, because that's how I've, I found, this is how 
cultural memory works in the modern world. So if, if the media stops talking about something, it just, it's almost as if they had erased it. They don't need to censor anything. They don't need to go into the libraries and remove anything. They just stop mentioning it and it disappears from the consciousness of millions of people. But this guy Husseini, who, who, who is now uh, largely forgotten by Westerners, uh, was as important as Adolf Hitler. That's, that's the kind of person we're talking about. Yeah, it was very important. He founded the Palestinian movement in uh, the, you know, 1919, something like that. And he was responsible for big terrorist attacks against the Jews living in British Mandate Palestine. Uh, and that history is interesting, but I want to, I'm going to skip it, but the, just there were, there were huge terrorist attacks organized by him. Uh, and he, he became the, the great mufti of Jerusalem. He was made great, great mufti of Jerusalem by the, uh, uh British, uh, uh, government, the colonial British government that was, uh, controlling the Brit uh, British mandate Palestine. Uh, and from that position, he, he organized these terrorist attacks. And then uh, the biggest one was called the Arab Revolt. It went from uh, 1936 to 1939. Uh, it ended with the outbreak of, of World War II. He, uh, Husseini had created such tremendous chaos and violence in British Mandate Palestine that the British finally intervened. So he, he left, he went to Iraq. In Iraq, he, uh, he was, you have to understand this guy had enormous prestige all over the Muslim world. He, he was an internationally known figure, uh, very respected uh, among many uh, Muslim leaders for his attacks against the Jews in Mandate Palestine. Uh, and he, when he went to Iraq, he was treated as if he were some kind of official leader of Muslims, something like that. So they gave him, you know, a budget. He, he became almost like a cabinet minister. Uh, and he started ordering people about and organized the Farhud, uh, which is a gigantic pogrom of the Jews of Baghdad uh, that pretty much ended Jewish life in Baghdad. Uh, Edwin Black, a very important historian, has, has a, a very good book on, on this event. And after doing that, Husseini went on to Italy, uh, where Mussolini received him as if he were a, a head of state. The, the, the fascists were very interested in, in Husseini and in making an alliance with Husseini because they were making important alliances with all kinds of uh, 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 rulers and leaders in the Muslim world. Uh, the Nazis had an extensive uh, system of diplomacy and alliance with uh, Muslim leaders. And so Husseini was very interesting to them because Husseini was so famous and had such high prestige all over the Muslim world that many people thought he was going to be the next caliph. Okay. So, so they received, uh, when, when Husseini arrived in Rome, Mussolini received them like a head of state and with all the pomp and circumstance. And then Husseini went on to Berlin where he was again received like a head of state. Uh, Hitler himself came out to receive him with all the dignitaries and the cameras flashing and the, and the uh, film rolling. Uh, it was, it, they treated it as a tremendous event and Hitler sat down to talk to him for, for a while. They, they, they came to some very important agreements. Uh, all the, your, your, your viewers can, can go see this. It's all over the internet that they can go to my YouTube channel, uh, the management of reality, uh, and uh, see the footage of Husseini meeting Hitler uh, because we, we have a, a short documentary on the history of Husseini and, and everything else. So, so they can see it there. Uh, and they agreed, Husseini and Hitler, that they would exterminate the Israeli, uh, well, the, they weren't Israelis yet, the, the, the Jews living in British Mandate Palestine. They would cleanse, ethnically cleanse the Middle East of Jews. That was their their agreement. Uh, they would co collaborate together to do that. Uh, now, they couldn't do that because the Nazis were stopped at El Alamein in Egypt. 
Uh, so the Nazis never got to never got to Jerusalem. But the consolation prize for Husseini was that he stayed in the orbit in in the in the Nazi occupied Europe for the rest of the war. Uh, he was very important to the Nazis. They gave him an entire bureaucracy. It was called Bureau des Gros Mufti. Uh, they gave him a budget, and he started doing all kinds of things. So he was very prominent in Nazi propaganda, inciting Muslims to kill Jews, uh, n Muslims allied with the Nazis, for example, in Bosnia and, and Kosovo. He organized entire divisions of Heinrich Himmler's SS that participated in the Yugoslav chapter of the Holocaust, killing Serbs, uh, Jews, and Roma, the people we often call gypsies. He, and, and, and that was already bad enough. I mean, so, so he, he was, that marks him off as a leader of the Holocaust, as an organizer of the Holocaust. Uh, but it gets worse because after the war, uh, the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal uh, was doing all kinds of investigations. And one of those investigations, a very important one, concerned the interrogation of Dieter Wieselseni, or Wieselseni, I never know exactly how to pronounce it. He was a uh, Czechoslovak who was right-hand man to Adolf Eichmann. Now, Adolf Eichmann is the recognized director of the death camp system. Uh, of the final solution. And uh, w according to him, he was executed by the uh, 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 Nuremberg uh, uh, Tribunal proceedings. But before he was executed for his uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, Vislaseni testified to a bunch of things because he was interviewed very extensively by the prosecutors. And they considered him a very good witness in the sense that he, he was very meticulous in giving them all kinds of detailed answers to their questions. And he corrected many things that they thought uh, that were mistaken and, and, and they were able to corroborate uh, his corrections and so forth. So he, this is a very careful witness, somebody who, who was executed because he was an evil, an evil bastard, uh, but who in the, in the last minute of his life decided to be a good witness. Uh, and he was a good witness. And what he what he said about uh, Al Husseini uh, was that Husseini had become immediately after arriving in Berlin. Husseini arrived in Berlin uh, in late October, nineteen forty one, and uh, he said that Husseini was the one who had convinced them to switch from a policy of expulsion to a policy of complete extermination. OK, so that's that's one thing just the said. He said he said and historians agree that up until the autumn of 1941, which is when Husseini arrived in Berlin, up until then, although the Nazis were killing many, many Jews, this is true. They had already begun killing many Jews, but they they still had a policy of expelling most Jews from the uh, Nazi occupied area and they had not yet decided to kill all Jews. That decision was taken in the Vance conference, which is January of 1942, uh, which is after Husseini had already been among them for several months. And according to Vizlaseni, he's the one who, who convinced them that they, they had to kill them all, according to Husseini, because they couldn't go to his Palestine. You see, he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't contemplate the Jews coming to Palestine and... Um, and, and, and the Nazis ended up agreeing with him that, that they should all be killed. So according to Vislaseni, this is what Husseini did. And also, he became Eichmann's best friend. And together with Eichmann, according to Husseini, uh, according to Vislaseni, uh, Husseini and Eichmann together uh, organized and directed the entire death camp system. So the father of the Palestinian movement is also the man responsible with Eichmann and Hitler and Himmler uh, of murdering the European Jewish population. Well, so that was a big, big, big turning point for me because when I found all of this out, I, I said to myself, well, something is, 
Something is funny with the world because w w why, why is this guy unknown? You know, we know about Hitler, we know about Himmler, we know about Eichmann. How come we don't know about this guy? And th so I started looking at it and, and, and I realized that there had been radio silence about this guy for decades. Nobody had mentioned him. So I thought, well, I, I should mention him because somebody should, because it, it not it, the most important intervention in the world of Haj Amin al Husseini in the post war, because he, he, he didn't escape. They allowed him to escape. They had him in house arrest in the outskirts of Paris at the end of the war. There were parliamentarians in the House of Commons screaming that Husseini had to be tried for war uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity and why wasn't he being tried at the uh, Nuremberg Tribunal what's going on you know they were very upset he was very famous they were very upset that uh, no trial had begun uh, but they had him in house arrest house arrest and of course he just walked out went to some uh, Arab embassy they gave him a passport and he uh, just left <laughs> he went to Cairo where Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, the Egyptian dictator, uh, protected him. Uh, Nasser had been allying, like many other Muslim leaders, with the Nazis. So he protected Husseini in Cairo. And in Cairo, in the 1950s, uh, with the help of several Nazi refugees, that uh, German Nazi refugees that arrived there to, to also get protection from Nasser, Husseini used some of these people, uh, apparently, to train uh, Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and a few other adolescents in the 1950s. Uh, and this is what became Al-Fatah. So Al-Fatah is a creation of Husseini's Arab Higher Committee. That was his, his organization. And Al-Fatah, uh, as your viewers may not know, is the uh, core governing core of what we now call the uh, Palestinian Authority. So Al-Fatah, Nasser had created a group called the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is a, a terrorist group uh, in 1964 is when it was created. Uh, but by 1970, Al-Fatah had swallowed the PLO. So, so Al-Fatah, so the PLO became basically Al-Fatah, although it had other terrorist groups also as appendages. But the, let's say, the governing core, the most important group in the PLO from 1970 onwards is Al-Fatah. So I, I always say PLO Fatah uh, to make that clear. And uh, PLO Fatah became a very important, uh, the most important terrorist group, uh, killing uh, Jews uh, and Israeli Jews and also f uh, people from other countries as part of its uh, campaign against the state of Israel. Uh, and, well, obviously, being a creation of Husseini, uh, Pilo Fatah has the clear mission of finishing the job that Husseini left unfinished because he could never get to Jerusalem. That was, that was his, the big lament of his life was that there were so many Jews still left to kill uh, in the Middle East that he hadn't been able to reach. So uh, Arafat and Abbas were supposed to continue that holy mission of, of jihad that uh, be, oh, because uh, PLO Fatah has been represented as a secular group, but you should know that Husseini was all about jihad. It was it was an entirely religious thing for him. He was the Mufti of Jerusalem, right? And he's the he's the creator of uh, PLO Fatah. So this t story we've been hearing about the supposedly secular PLO Fatah is, uh, in my opinion, a, a crock. It's just not true at all. Um, just to finish, sorry, uh, I, I know you're taking air. I've been speaking for a long time. Just, I'm almost done. So, so uh, Pilo Fatah uh, pretended in in the run up to the Oslo Accords to have seen the light and and uh, and uh, started saying that they they wanted peace now for in exchange for a piece of territory, blah blah blah, and that's the representation, the, the narrative that was used to promote the diplomacy that got Pilo Fatah inside the Jewish state. So when I, when I, when I saw all this, I, 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 I said to myself, so the Jewish state was created after World, World War II to protect Jews from Nazi exterminations. 
And here we have the organization created by the Nazi exterminator of the European Jews being introduced into the Jewish state to be the government over the Arabs in strategic territory because it's high ground. Judea and Samaria is high ground, what they call the West Bank. So I thought, well, this is an attack on Israel, obviously. What else could it be? How, how, how can it make any sense to introduce into strategic territory of the state created to protect the Jews from extermination, to put there, to rule over the Arabs, the organization created by the guy who killed the European Jews? No, nothing could be a bigger aberration. So I thought, well, somebody has to say this because uh, all of this information is crucial to uh, understanding what the Arab-Israeli conflict really is. So I published this. I, I First, I published it in, in Emperor's Clothes. And uh, that was read by people at Israel National News, Arut Sheva, the religious Zionists in Israel. So they they asked me to republish and uh the consequence of getting that piece published in israel in israel national news uh was that i was fired from the university of pennsylvania uh, and that that was a big a big shock to my system it, it made me realize that i i didn't understand the system i was in there's so many questions there's a, there, there's a lot to unpack there francisco and thank you for being so thorough and, and just so you know the, all the space you need to to give this to give out your ideas, you don't need to worry about taking the air. That's that's why I host you. But okay, no, no. I but I realize I I can go on and on, so I I should I should make pauses. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just to keep keep that thread. So the first initial question that I have, and then we can unpack a bit more all of the situation, and of course get deeper into the Israeli Palestinian war. <clears throat> why did they fire you? Why was this? such a revealing truth and why was it counter to the for, so, to the macro american system and of course to you penn you university of pennsylvania is such a prestigious university right so your your questions are very good because the the, the and and i think they're helpful uh uh as as a as a next in, sort of a chapter of this because the model that people have in, in most people have in their heads Okay, so first of all, let, let me backtrack a little bit. I want to talk about how we get our models, uh, because that's a very important question. So we get our models of the world through the media, mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have direct contact with the world, right? So, so none of us is... Uh, uh, you, you, what you witness directly is almost nothing. So you have a few interactions with your friends, with your family, you know, the world you see when you're driving around in your car or walking in your neighborhood. There are a, a, a very few things that you do witness personally and directly, but that's it. Almost everything you believe about the world, even about your own city, almost everything you believe is true about what's happening in your own city. It all comes to you through the media. Uh, what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Israel, China, India, Mexico, the U.S., anything. You, it's all the media. So the media constructs your reality. And therefore, if the media has been saying that the United States government is the biggest ally of Israel, and uh, you hear academics everywhere in every university repeating this, if you hear supporters of Israel saying it over and over again, and you hear enemies of Israel saying the same thing over and over again, and you hear the governments of both countries the, the governments of every country, but also the government of the United States and the government of Israel, you know, all of them saying that the United States is the biggest ally of Israel. Well, then that becomes your model. You, it becomes your geopolitical model, right? It, why? Because you have no other access to reality unless you start doing historical research like I did. But most people have no no inclination, time or energy to do any of that or, or even the skills uh, a lot of the time. Uh, although I think... Uh, 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 citizen journalism is proving that these skills can be developed rel relatively quickly. It's 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 not, it's not nuclear physics. Uh, all citizens can start doing this, and and they should. Um, so uh, the model you have in your head is the model that the media puts in your head. So what I'm saying is very surprising. If your model is that 
the United States government is the biggest ally of Israel. Uh, now, when you get evidence that dramatically contradicts that, then you have to search for a different model, one that will be consistent with the facts. Uh, and so that's what I started doing. Uh, the, the first thing I started doing is I started looking into the entire history of U.S. foreign policy towards Israel. And I have a little ebook published uh, uh, in my old website, which is still available as an archive. It's called Historical and Investigative Research. So I published there a, a, a book, an ebook uh, that traces the entire history of U.S. foreign policy towards the Jews and then towards Israel. And I was a, then able to see the pattern, the, and, the, and the pattern was not one of alliance. The pattern was one of the United States consistently doing important stuff to weaken the security of the Israeli state while claiming all the time in public that they were supporting these, the Israeli state, right? So that uh, uh, began to open my eyes even more. I was like, oh, okay, well then this is consistent with not telling people who Husseini is, pretending that Pilo Fatah has changed its colors and inventing a uh, diplomatic process to bring Pilo Fatah into Israel and threatening Israel because they threatened Israel with the removal of U.S. aid, uh, uh, military and financial, if Israel didn't participate in, in the Oslo process uh, to bring Pilo Fatah into Israel. All of that happened, right? So in the context of this, this larger history that I was now researching, it became clear to me that this was consistent. It made sense that the, the U.S. had a, a, a consistent pattern of undermining the security of the Israeli state. Um, and then I started, and, and then I discovered Edwin Black. Uh, uh, thanks to J Jared. Jared is the guy who got me to read Edwin Black. And Edwin Black had written a, a book uh, called War Against the Weak. Uh, War Against the Weak is, is one of the most important books ever written uh, in, in all of history, in, in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's definitely for the understanding of modern history, because Edwin Black resurrected from oblivion uh, a subject that is most important. He, after the, just like Husseini, the same thing hap that happened with Husseini, where for decades, they stopped talking about him, right? And then he disappeared from from the consciousness of democratic citizens in, in the West. Everybody just forgot about Husseini because the media didn't mention him, right? The same thing happened with eugenics. So eugenics was not a secret when it was happening. It was an open thing. It was a gigantic international movement. It was especially big in the United States. It was biggest in the United States for a long time uh, until Germany overtook it. Uh, but... Uh, Eugenics was a gigantic U.S. phenomenon. And this is important because eugenics is the original ideology of the biological, alleged biological superiority of Germanic peoples. That's what eugenics is. And it had a whole pseudoscientific apparatus uh, behind it. So... Uh, Huge fortunes were spent uh, raising the prestige of certain biologists and psychologists and social scientists and so forth who were who were defending this idea, uh, and it was dressed up in in suicide. So so what they would tell people is that um, the poor people were poor because they were stupid because they had bad genes. Uh, rich people and powerful people were, were rich and powerful because they were smart because they had good genes. Uh, these are the people that started using IQ tests to diagnose the intelligence of people and so forth. It's a big fraud. It's a big scientific fraud. Uh, and um, the, the program was to use these IQ tests to, quote unquote, prove that people in the lower classes uh, had lower intelligence because they had bad genes uh, and justify with that, quote unquote, diagnosis, um, horrific things like uh, putting people in special prisons that they called uh, colonies for epileptics and uh, feeble-minded until their reproductive period was over, which for men is until they die. Um, or they would uh, sterilize them, forcibly sterilize people so they couldn't reproduce. Or they, they separated people who were married. They did hor hor horrific things. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of people 
uh, according to Edwin Black's documentation, uh, were treated this way in the United States, in the United States, in the United States, in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and the there were gigantic, uh, these big monopolists, the, the, the biggest industrialists in the United States were, were financing this. The people like John D. Rockefeller, uh, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, um, and, and others uh, were sinking just billions of dollars into this. So all of this was happening in the United States, uh, and the same people who were promoting this in the United States were exporting it internationally. Uh, and a lot of this money was going to Germany uh, to uh, make German eugenics flourish. The German eugenicists were learning everything from the Americans. So one of the things that uh, uh, your listeners should know is that the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 were modeled on the uh, legal uh, uh, developments in the U.S. where everything had been done first. Uh, so the Nuremberg Laws of the Nazis in 1935 are the, the laws that uh, are the, the, the backbone of the entire T4 uh, project, which is when they began carting off people they considered inferior uh, um, into uh, concentration camps. This is not yet extermination of, of the entire Jewish people. That, that was not happening yet. But, but they were certainly carting off certain categories of people to, uh, to concentration camps uh, uh, with those laws. And um, those were modeled after what had been achieved in the United States. So once you, once you put, put all of this context uh, together uh, and you realize that, that the people in, in, the, in Great Britain and the United States who were at the very top of the power structure were devotees of the same ideology that we associate with Adolf Hitler, right? So eugenics is the parent movement that produced German Nazism. Um, it was one of one of the quotes of of Edwin Black's book. Uh, he says uh, he says it it ended up in Auschwitz, but it started in Long Island or something like that. It's the other way around. It started in Long Island, ended up in Auschwitz uh, b because the American eugenicists with, with Andrew Carnegie's money and Rockefeller's money and so forth, they created a gigantic complex in Cold Spring Harbor, uh, New York. Um, and they were collecting statistics about all kinds of, all kinds of stuff about uh, Americans, U.S. citizens to find out, you know, who, who was going to be uh, oppressed, who was going to be put in jail and who was going to be forcibly sterilized and all this stuff. So that's where this, that's where Nazism comes from. Uh, and once you understand that, uh, yeah, the post-war behaviors of the U.S. power elite towards Israel are easier to understand. They, 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 it, it becomes less of an aberration because your model is now changing. Now you can see, oh, I see. So the, so the people running the United States in the first half of the 20th century had a movement that is basically the same ideology as Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, and they were actually supporting the growth of that in Germany, sending money, and they were controlling the U.S. government, right? They, had, they got the U.S. Supreme Court in 1924 to approve forced sterilization, and those same people put Roosevelt in the White House. The, uh, uh, the Rockefellers were quite instrumental in supporting uh, Roosevelt's presidential campaign, uh, and of course they were very powerful. They were doing this out of the Chase Manhattan uh, uh, bank. Once you once you adopt this this other model, of course, new questions come into view which need to be solved. So, for example, one question, one obvious question is, well, then what was World War II? Right? Because uh, there was a, a declaration of war between the United States and Germany. So, what about that? Right? Uh, and 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 that means that you need to start looking into the details of the war. Uh, which I did. I now have a, an entire book series on this, but uh, just not to make the story too long. One of the things you uh, need to look again at when you start changing your model is appeasement. And in this narrative, Neville Chamberlain and the uh, uh, earlier rulers of, of Britain, uh, uh, 
and uh, Daladier in, in France and, and, uh, and even Roosevelt in the United States are represented as innocents. Uh, so, so they were not too smart in this narrative. They, they didn't understand Hitler well enough or in time. They were too stubborn, uh, didn't want to believe that this guy really meant what he said. Um, and they were also cowardly. So when uh, at opportune moments, they could have stopped Hitler with a very small cost, relatively small cost. Uh, but they were too timid. They didn't act in time. They were not forceful enough. Uh, and they developed a policy of trying to see if they could make Hitler happy by giving him the things he wanted and thus appeasing him. This is where the word comes from, uh, appeasing him and in that way avoid uh, a general war, right? So this is the narrative that emerges. This is what we all learn in school. Appeasement was a big mistake. These people were idiots. They were cowards. Uh, when when you read carefully this narrative, it cannot explain anything. Peter, this doesn't make any sense. Look at just look at what they did. They gave Hitler. They allowed him to build submarines. They allowed him to um, reoccupy the Rhineland. Um, uh, they allowed him to you know uh, swallow Austria and then kill Czechoslovakia and so so it, it, at every juncture and I'm giving you the big ones there are also smaller details and at every little or large juncture where the western leaders made a decision that ended up helping Hitler strategically if you're an astronomer say you, you're interested in the movements of heavenly bodies and you have a theory of these heavenly bodies right you have a model of how they're supposed to work and as you look at their movements uh, and you chart their trajectories, you keep saying to yourself, well, that, that the moon shouldn't be there. Uh, what's Mars doing over there? Uh, wait, wait a minute. What the comet? You mean the comet goes from here to here? Well, that that's absurd. That doesn't make any sense. If that's the way you're talking about the heavenly bodies, what it means is that you have a terrible model. You don't understand gravity. You don't understand how these um uh bodies relate to each other right uh when you have a good model you stop talking like that everything suddenly makes sense well of course it's going over there well, but my equations predict that it should go over there and and uh, yeah the moon is doing this because the the earth is over here and the sun is pulling it and so forth right when you have a good model the puzzles disappear that's the whole point point of having a good model so the fact that Scheider and every other historian of world war ii talks about appeasement as something that is inexplicable means that they're simply wrong. They have the wrong model of what was going on. Now, when you substitute this model that they gave us, where uh, Western leaders who, who had to deal with Hitler were supposedly idiots and cowards, you replace it with the model that says, no, no, they, they were not appeasing Hitler. They were promoting Hitler. Wow. Right? These were eugenicists. Once you understand that they're eugenicists, you can start imagining that everything they did was policy rather than a bunch of mistakes that somehow miraculously always went in the same direction of assisting Hitler's conquest, right? Um, uh, Brett Weinstein has a lot of discussions uh, of this topic. He, uh, he often says zero is a special number, right? Uh, and that's a, that's a useful phrase because if pretty much everything they're doing helps Hitler, then it's not random. Random mistakes go in different directions. But this was a very, appeasement was a very consistent uh, series of policy decisions that all ended up helping out Hitler, right? Um, so, I mean, people are not that stupid. Stupidity doesn't get you that. That's not incompetence, that's competence. Right. So then you have to switch your model of their intentions and, and then everything makes sense. Once you know that they were eugenicists. So Neville Chamberlain, uh, uh, this is the clincher for me uh, in the appeasement uh, story. Neville Chamberlain, who is the poster child for appeasement, he's if if you're only going to say one thing about appeasement, you know, if if you have only two words to talk about appeasement, you will say Neville Chamberlain, right? Is the poster child. Well, turns out Neville Chamberlain was a major eugenicist, so he keeps being represented as this bumbling fool, this idiot who didn't understand anything. Come on, man. Neville Chamberlain, <laughs> Neville Chamberlain was the most powerful man on earth.
and he didn't inherit the job, he won it. Neville Chamberlain became, became prime minister of Great Britain when Great Britain was ruling the world. You think that guy is an idiot? Never Chamberlain was, was uh, considered a god by uh, uh, the aristocrats who crowded around the conservative party of Britain. He was considered, he was an alpha male. He was, he was uh, and historians have documented that Neville Chamberlain, uh, this was documented in the 1980s, uh, although, of course, you'll never hear about this in the media, but it was documented by academic historians at Oxford and Cambridge. Their investigations were published in the best historical journals. Uh, it was documented that he had the entire British press on a short leash through the clandestine services of the uh, uh, British Secret Service, the, the, uh, MI5 and MI6. They, they, they had the, the whole British press became a clandestine monopoly controlled by Neville Chamberlain through his best friend, Joseph Ball. So they were managing our reality, right? They, they, they had the entire press. Uh, the same thing was happening in the United States. Uh, the Rockefeller, who was a, another eugenicist, a, 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 one of the most important ones, uh, had a whole, this was documented by historian Christopher Simpson, another key historian that everybody should read. Uh, Christopher Hins Simpson wrote a, a very important investigation called Science of Coercion, where he documents how the Rockefeller network uh, was taking over the press uh, in the 1930s. They had this gigantic program to study psychological warfare, how to use the media to manage the reality of uh, U.S. citizens, right? So this was... And, and they were corrupting. They were allied with CBS and, and everybody else, and, and they were they were uh, corrupting the U.S. press. So once once you put all this context together, appeasement looks very very different. It it looks like like uh, like a plan that was put into place um, to fool Western citizenries, make them believe that Western leaders were opposed to Nazism because they had to they had to do that simulation. Otherwise, there would have been revolutions in the West because obviously U.S. citizens ordinary Western citizens, uh, great multitudes of them were very afraid of the Nazis and, and viscerally opposed. So the Western leaders had to pretend to, uh, to be enemies of the Nazis. But, uh, but what they were doing in terms of policy is very different. Now, of course, that opens a new question, which is, well, what about the war declaration? Because eventually they did go to fight with the Nazis and so forth. Uh, and that also needs to be uh, answered by a full model. Um, and, uh, I have answers to all of those questions. I've, I've, I've put them in my book. I, I believe I, I have a relatively complete model of, of what happened now. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is the process. So every time you, you, you explain something, you notice something else that doesn't quite fit. Well, then you need to go look at that and, uh, learn more until you produce a model where it does fit because eventually your theory has to explain everything. There can be no paradoxes. Okay, so if you have a model where you, you, you have some important pa paradoxes, that means you're not finished. You got to keep working. Uh, and when you have a model where pretty much everything that happened is a paradox, which is the um, original story that they've been telling us about about World War II in school, right? Which is Shirer uh, and Churchill. If, 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 if everything that happened is inexplicable, then you know you are completely wrong and you need to start rethinking everything you think you know oh, wow i i have to take a deep breath because it's a it's a bit overwhelming to hear you francisco in the sense that there is there are many paradoxes in my mind there is many themes there and there's so many uh ways that i can i can ask you so many questions regarding world war ii or anything i just need to bring our attention to to the present moment you mentioned sure. red weinstein so we also need to to address that but I think it's an important paradox I need to address of my own and perhaps one of that my listeners will have is, of course, it goes without saying that you reveal all of these truths and then Yupen says, you got to go. This, this goes, without, uh, this goes uh, outside of our perception of reality that you said is mediated by, by media. And like you say, I'm, I'm not in Israel right now, so everything that I'm reading is through citizen journalism, of course, but also through mass media. But I think the biggest paradox I have here, Francisco, and, and, and trying to bring it to the present moment is that we see every single speech by every single U.S. president throughout 
perhaps World War II then on, that states we're strongly in favor of an Israeli state. We unequivocally support Israel. Then you see all of the aid that Israel receives. You see the, the also there's many people who are of Jewish descent that are in positions of power in the United States. And so the biggest paradox that I have personally is how can I reconcile the idea that is the United States who's trying to, you know, set these perfect pieces of the puzzle. Well, it's not the United States. It, we, I think we have to be clear about that. So but one of the things I always insist when we try to improve our models to get a better handle on geopolitics, mm -hmm. the first thing we have to do is stop talking about uh, countries as if they were persons. Right. Uh, so if you if you notice, I've been careful to say that the Israeli, go the uh, U.S. government is supposed to be the best friend of Israel, right? The U.S. government, I'm, I'm talking about the people who make the decisions, not about the country. So I don't like to say United States. I like to say the U.S. power elite or the U.S. government or one of these uh, uh, ways of describing the, the group that is in power and that is making the decisions because ordinary U.S. citizens uh, don't get to make any of these decisions. And I think most of them would be horrified by everything that you you and I have been discussing. So uh, it's it's the U.S. power elite. So you, let's just humor me and let's let's talk like that because it's it's um, it's useful for people to get used to separating the citizenry from power elite. Well, I gotta be the first one to take your course on management of reality too, to start rethinking the way I see things. But Francisco, so let, let's 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 talk about that. And okay. So let's go through your paradoxes. Which one do you want first? The the, the one that, that that I was mentioning was that it's the power elite who who is trying to build kind of like this perfect storm where Israel or the state of Israel or correct me if I'm wrong on that sense is undermined and perhaps destroyed. Where you see that the elite decided to subdue or, or, or just mute the story of Hajam Amin al Husseini, if I'm saying the nom name correctly. Yes, Hajam Amin al Husseini, that's correct. And so they themselves knew that he was going to set the, 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 orga the Palestinian Liberation Organization in, in Israel, and then that in itself is a ticking bomb because he's jihad, and jihad says, you know, everyone who's not. Uh, following the Islamic rule and following our our religion is an infidel. And the first ones on that front line are the Jewish people, Israel. And so the power elite knows this. And so the paradox that I have here is we still, I still see from the outside on up until now, which is the bombshell, I think the collective bombshell that we've all witnessed throughout these two weeks is that Israel has become stronger and stronger and stronger since its inception. That's the, the assumption. And one of the other assumptions is that behind, and perhaps the biggest ally explicitly, is the country, the nation, the United States. But at the same time, you have this power elite who's trying to undermine it. And in a sense, long-term thinking, they were part of the... They were the, 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 the actors, the, the puppeteers who made this perfect storm happen right now, where we're at the cusp of a World War III, and we're one of, it's not the first time that we see Israel about to end, quote unquote, or the, the, perhaps the, the prospect of it ending, but it's getting way, way crazier in the, the whole conversation there. So that's the paradox sure. is, is the power elite trying to undermine the United States while making it so that it's strengthening. So that, that for me and perhaps for our listeners is just a mind-boggling... Um... But so could, could, you, could you say what you perceive the paradox to be in just one short statement so that I can dig into it? Yeah. The paradox is that the assumption that the biggest ally is the Western society and perhaps American people... Not the well, I think, people. Western, I, I think the American people are largely an ally. I think they are. Again, I think that the problem is the power elite. Um, so in the United States, you have you have a very large population of Protestant Christians who who tend to be very strong supporters of, of Israel. Uh, 
but the, the the problem is the people making the decisions and also the people uh controlling the uh re reality through the media mm -hmm. uh and through the educational system because the attitudes of ordinary americans can change over time if they are subjected for a long enough time to the uh, to the uh sort of the, the media sphere in w that is giving them this interpretation right so people it, it it's it's funny because pe people the, the there is a propaganda against the jews that was very important before world war ii it's called the protocols of the elders of zion mm -hmm. protocols of the learned elders of zion and <clears throat> that propaganda was created by the russians by the by the czar by the secret po secret police of the czar right around the turn of the 20th century uh in that propaganda it, describes the Jewish people as as a secret conspiracy that controls all of the major institutions in the West, uh, supposedly, right? So the the uh, media, the banks, the the uh, uh, workers' movements, the, the capitalist industries, the, the governments of the West, everything, everything is supposed to be controlled by the Jews, according to this propaganda. And, and this is the propaganda that scared everybody, right? So why did so many people collaborate with the process of exterminating the European Jewish population in World War II? Well, because they were scared of the Jews, because the, this propaganda had made them believe. This propaganda was spread all over the world. Uh, Henry Ford sank billions into getting these ideas into everybody's heads, right? So everybody thought that the, that the Jews were were this giant conspiracy that was going to strangle the world and and enslave Christians, right? This is what they told people. The refutation, the decisive refutation of this propaganda was the Holocaust, Shoah, because the European Jews were relatively easy to kill because all of these institutions and governments uh, and movements that they supposedly controlled clandestinely, uh, they didn't defend the Jews. They collaborated, most of them, with the uh, with the process, or simply didn't do anything. Right? They, 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 there, there was there was either zero courage, or there was uh, uh, a, a connivance and collusion with the process of killing the European Jews. So, so the Jews controlled everything, and everything then killed the Jews. That doesn't make any sense. That's the, obviously you got the wrong model. So the so the Holocaust proved that this. Uh, propaganda about Jewish control was nonsense, but the propaganda didn't die because we live in a profoundly anti-Semitic civilization. Our, uh, Western civilization was founded, our Christian Western civilization was founded on the story that the Jews killed God, and, and that's a very difficult accusation to shake, um, and, and it created a bed of plausibility in Western consciousness for any any libel against the Jews, any accusation against the Jews. So uh, even though the, the Shoah, the Holocaust, decisively refuted the accusation that the Jews were a secret conspiracy that controlled everything in secret, um, because they, all of the institutions they supposedly controlled were colluding to kill them, right? Even though that was refuted, in the post-war, everybody again, again believes it. That's how strong anti-Semitism is. You, you ask people in the street who controls the media, they will all say the Jews. Kanye West too. Of course, but they don't stop to see. This is where we need critical thinking. We, we really need to, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think a, f a few people in podcast space have really been doing a good job about this. Brett Weinstein among them, uh, Dave Rubin. Uh, there are several people who have been uh, it's certainly... Um, Jordan Peterson, uh, Joe Rogan, lots of people have been uh, helping us develop the skills, you know, d helping the citizenries of the West uh, redevelop the skills of, of critical thinking. It's very important. And I'm going to help them. One, uh, I'm going to make a, a contribution to that right now. Yeah. So Kanye, Kanye West and a lot of people believe that this, 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 this idea that the Jews control the media, right? Now watch this. At the same time, these people believe that the Jewish state, Israel, is oppressing the Arab Palestinians. Now, you and I were discussing earlier that we have zero contact with reality. 
the model of reality that we have in our heads comes through the media. So if Kanye West believes that the Israeli state is oppressing the Arab Palestinians, the only reason he believes that is because the media has made him believe that. His contact with the Arab-Israeli conflict is entirely mediated. It comes through the big media, right? So if he believes that the Israeli state is oppressing the Palestinians, that model is in his head because of the media. There's no other way to get the model. He's not a historian. He's not studying. Uh, uh, he's not chasing down, uh, you know, uh, uh, exotic little facts uh, uh, like a scientist. He's just absorbing whatever happens in the media, right? So if he believes the Israeli state is oppressing the Palestinians, he shouldn't believe that the Jews control the media. Why would the Jews control the media to make him believe that the Israeli state is the bad guy? Obviously, if he believes the Israeli state is the bad guy and his only contact with reality is the media, the first hypothesis should be, if, if, you have, if, if you're going to defend a conspiracy theory, your first hypothesis should be that the enemies of the Jews control the media. Otherwise, why, do you, why, do you, why are you so sure that the Jews are bad? Right? But no, his conspiracy theory is exactly the opposite. He believes that the Jews control the media, even though he, his, his picture of the world, which came through the media, tells him that the Jews are bad. That makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. No, it doesn't. And it's, it's again, mind-boggling. And I think that this is a perfect way to... to and again, I, just a, a brief uh, parenthesis, I will make everything in my strength, in my power, to make you get to the Brett Weinstein podcast, the Dark Horse podcast. We, we have to... Have, <laughs> We have to address uh, something that you wrote about, about you know, something that Brett Weinstein talked, but that's a bit further then and perhaps on later on. But Francisco, I think that the mind-boggling thing for me too is that every time I see in, in the United States, in the West, uh, mm. people, regular citizens holding a Palestinian flag, and, and when I first read about the story of, of Husseini, and his Nazi party affiliation. I just, and perhaps I'm a, a bit too far-fetched here, but every time I see the flag and the people saying, kill all the Jews, I don't think they're connecting the dots and saying like they're basically, it's like an undercurrent of the Nazi movement in a sense. And you can create, make a perfect connection there. So I think the question here is how, you know, the, the, it's, it's a very big misconception and one that's been mediated with, with the media, of course, like we've been dis discussing, it's the perception of our reality is mediated in a big way. But, you know, this is a big misconception that people don't realize is that one of the biggest founding movements of the Palestinian liberation is directly tied with Nazism. And so how would people now that knowing that truth and fact-checking it themselves, because as you say, it's historically uh, backed up and there's all of the references there. Well, there. There are some very good investigations about this. So, for example, there's a, there's a recent book by Wolfgang Schwanitz and uh, what was his name? Ba Barry Rubin, uh, uh, recently deceased. Uh, Barry Rubin, they, they wrote a book... Um, here I can look it up, um, but they, they they wrote a book uh, on the relationship between the Nazis and the Muslim world, where the yeah uh, and, uh, everything was needed. And you and you cover that uh, in the first half of the conversation really thoroughly. And of course, I'm gonna put all of the links in the in the notes because it's it's oh good it's, excellent yeah and, so that's where people can start with that yeah yeah and you can send me all of the other information that you think is is relevant. But the the question here is. Would that be a checkmate or would that be like just just the idea that Nazism is somehow directly tied with these organizations? Would that be like a, a checkmate in the sense that we shouldn't we shouldn't support this movement in the West because that implies that the West in itself, if Israel falls, the West is next? Well, I, I mean, so I don't know what's a checkmate, honestly, because uh, Western audiences have been poisoned for decades. And you're seeing the effects of that now. So uh, what you're seeing all over the world, which is very worrisome all over the West, 
is a consequence of two things. One is uh, immigration of radical Muslims into the West. Uh, many of the people protesting in Western cities are radical Muslims, uh, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are people who've been poisoned by woke. Uh, and I saw woke happening when when I was teaching at, when I was getting my PhD at UCLA. I, I this was already beginning to happen in a big way. Um, it wasn't as bad as it's now, of course. I mean, the the, the rot in our university system has only continued to grow uh, in, in, in the last half century, but, but, um, I saw all of this happen uh, and how p people were indoctrinated in these social science courses, grievance studies that they invented, uh, to convince people that the proper way to advance what they call social justice was for everybody to be at each other's throats, right? So this, this is what they, they did. They splintered they splintered the citizenry into smaller and smaller identities. Uh, and each identity was defined by its special grievance against the power structure and so forth. So instead of uniting us, the people who pushed woke uh, have been dividing us into smaller and smaller tribes, all of them violently against each other. Um, and of course, that's useful to the power elite, right? The, the, the divide and conquer strategy is very useful to the power elite. But woke has been very bad for us, and some elements of woke are truly poisonous. It, they, they make people unable to process moral questions. So, so now we see people demonstrating in favor of Hamas. How is that possible? Hamas is not shy about its about its goals. The the constitution of Hamas, the, the what they call the Hamas Covenant, the Hamas Covenant. Uh, is quite clear uh, there's there's no ambiguity in that document they they say that they're fighting infidels they're, they don't say they're fighting oppression they're fighting infidels it's a religious holy war it's a jihad um and uh it's not just against the jews in israel uh it the, the jihad is a general one it's just that they're in the Middle East and the Jews are right next to them and they're going to start with the Jews. But the, the program is, is, won't end there. Uh, they're very clear about that. Uh, so this movement, which is anti-Western, which w wants to uh, uh, murder and enslave infidels, uh, is being defended by, by the first people those infidels are going to kill, uh, those uh, Muslims are going to kill uh, if, if they ever... Uh, have more power, right? If 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 Hamas were to take over the United States government, the first people they were they're they're going to get rid of is uh, all these LGBTQ activists uh, uh, who who are are uh, demonstrating in, in favor of Hamas. Those, those are the first people to go. We 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 have no beef against them. Gender identity. Who cares? The West transcended that a long time ago. They they're they're pretending that we haven't, right? They they have to keep inventing these fake prejudices that we supposedly still have. We don't. Westerners are very tolerant about that stuff. The, the people who are, are, are going to be uh, terribly intolerant are these people they're now defending. So this is evidence of woke sort of destroying the ability to think critically. And that happened in the universities. Now, when the universities are destroying the ability of people to think critically, you know that something very evil has taken over the system because the university is the place where you're supposed to be learning how to think, how to apply critical thinking, how to do science, how to separate myth from fact, uh, how to uh, compare hypotheses against each other so that you can improve your models of the universe. That's what a university is supposed to be doing. But what the universities have been doing is they have been teaching people that politics is reality, that whatever your politics are, and, and, and you have to have the right politics, because if you don't have the right politics, you cannot be tolerated, right? The university is supposed to be the place where all different viewpoints are tolerated so that we can all learn from each other, so that we can find errors in our models uh, by challenging each other, right? That's what a university is supposed to do. But what they've been doing for a half century is uh, telling people that the only thing that matters is your political position and the only political position acceptable is the moral position and the only moral uh, position acceptable is the one that woke people are defending. Well, that sounds a lot like Islam, right? Islam is in structural terms, maybe not in content, but in structural terms, is the, the core of Islam is 
you're only a good person if you agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, I'll kill you. That's Orthodox Islam. That's what the Quran says. The, the, uh, your viewers shouldn't believe people telling them that uh, uh, radical Islam is somehow contradicting the Quran. It's not. The Quran is page after page after page of, of, of a crazy obsession with infidels and how to punish infidels. Right. So it, it's not true that radical Islam is, is somehow a, a it's ortho, radical Islam is orthodox Islam. This, the, the people should understand that. Uh, and which is not to say that the uh, you have to we, we have to make these these uh, 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 caveats. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't lots of good Muslims out there. there. Of course, that's true. There are many good Muslims. And 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 m m some of these Muslims have been bravely defending Israel. I've seen some v videos going around by by Muslims uh, defending the Palestinians from the oppression of Hamas and defending the Jews from the attacks of Hamas and saying the only way the Palestinians are ever going to be free is if Hamas and Peel of Fatah, by the way, are completely uh, uh, defeated. And, and they're right, and, and there are may, may, many good Muslims, but, the, but the, the thing that people must understand in the West is that a, 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 when a Muslim is a good person, they're bad Muslims. So they're good people. There are many Muslims that are good people, but that makes them bad Muslims because the Quran doesn't want them to be good people. The, the Quran does preach holy war against infidels. It's all in there. And, and people shouldn't believe Western academics who say otherwise. They should go read the Quran. That's what critical thinking is. Critical thinking is not, oh, I'll see what the expert says and whatever the expert says, especially if it's the expert that the right people chose for me, right? Then I'll believe him or her. That's not critical thinking. Critical thinking is whatever Francisco said, I'm not going to believe it. I don't want anybody to believe me. I want people to do critical thinking. Critical thinking is Francisco said something, I don't buy it. I'm going to go check it. That's critical thinking. So when, when, when academic... When Western academics say that Islam is the relig uh, you know, the religion of peace and bullshit, 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 people should go read the Quran. That's the first thing they should do. Yeah. Go read the Quran. See if see if the apologies that are being published and and uh, spread by Western academics and the media about the supposed peace of Islam uh, have anything to do with what is written in the Quran and the Hadiths. Go read it, Francisco. I don't. I don't think. I have to underline and stress it out because I don't think that it's not being said. It's not being said enough and stressed enough and underlined enough that I think the underlying message here that that you're saying that you're expressing here in a way it's of course you know a brief a brief parenthesis. But I saw a video of an LGBTQ member who transitioned from I think from man to woman but just you, it, I, i'll show you the video i put the video on the link but so what we call a trans woman now yeah and 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 yeah. and, and he was or she was strongly defending uh hamas and the palestinian movement and people were commenting okay go to gaza right now and see if, how how they'll host you and wouldn't last a second wouldn't last a second in gaza and, and that's that's the important thing and and the important thing here is that like you say the it's all mediated from from the media and 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 this reality, this postmodern reality where we are, where these, these connections happen, where Hamas is not affiliated in any way whatsoever in freedom rights. And if Nothing. You wanna, if you want to do the, the, the comparison, most people from the LGBTQ community would say, I would strongly support Israel because Tel Aviv is one of the most uh, friend, gay-friendly cities in the world. Of course. That's Look, we, we are so tolerant about gender diversity in the West. So yeah. tolerant. And, that and, we have been letting we have been letting the gender activists bully us for a long time. Yeah. It, in Gaza, they wouldn't be able to bully anyone. The only place where they can bully uh, so-called conservatives and 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 uh, what they think what they keep calling the extreme right, which of course <laughs> we we're, we the the people who oppose woke the the great majority of the people who oppose woke and I count myself among them. We're simply defending traditional Western democracy. So call us conservatives if you want. But the thing we want to conserve is democracy. Uh, uh, the, the thing we want to conserve is the constitutional order, uh, the tolerance of intellectual diversity, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. That's what we want to conserve. So if that makes us conservatives, okay. But what we want to conserve is democracy. Uh, that used to be, that used to be a, a goal of the left, but the left has become totalitarian. 
Yeah, and, and that, that was exactly my question. And like you say, it started to conserve the Western values that we cherish. And, and so you write in, in Management of Reality, Francisco, you write that the democra democratic simulation is ending. That's a very strong statement. And so my question that emerged from that is, do you think that Israel, right now with the war with Hamas and the potential war of escalating, do you think Israel is the last line for defense? for the West and for democracies? And what would happen if, if Israel falls? Okay, so I, thank you for this question. Um, it's a very important question. I think the way to answer it is the, the first thing people should do is they should think back to World War II, right? Because <clears throat> but World War II, it, it's not the only case. I can give you many examples, and if time permits, I will. But uh, it's the recent case. It's the one that people are most familiar with, and it's a very dramatic case. So think back to World War II. Uh, what we saw in World War II is that the people who were hell-bent on murdering the Jewish people in Europe were very bad for all of us. You see, this is, this is the thing that really that people really need to understand. The Nazis were very bad for all of us. I'm not Jewish. People ask me, well, why would you, why are you expending so much energy defending the Jews? You're not even Jewish. And I'm like, dude, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not this is not an act of charity. I'm, I'm defending myself. This is self-defense. This is Western self-defense. Anti-Semitism is, is a danger to the West. We saw it in World War II. So the anti-Semites, the people that wanted to kill all of the Jews, what did they do? They, they plunged us into a world war. The entire planet was sucked into their war. The anti-Semites are very bad for us. Very, very bad for us. All of us, whether Jewish or not. So between five and six million Jews were murdered uh, in Europe in Shoah, in, in the Holocaust. But, in, of, of course, th that's very important. We can't forget that. Never again. I agree with that. But it's also important to remember that more than 64 million non-Jews were also killed in that war. And hundreds of millions of non-Jews were enslaved, lost all of their rights and liberties, right? Who did that to them? The anti-Semites. My God, how, how is it possible that people can't learn this lesson? The anti-Semites are a danger to all of us, because anti-Semitism is the tool of totalitarian uh, expansion. That's what anti-Semitism is, and it has been that for a very long time, very long time. So if you go back in time uh, to the late 19th century, early 20th century, who was killing lots of Jews? The Russian Empire. What was the Russian Empire? It was an autocratic, quasi-totalitarian nightmare. That's what the Russian Empire was. You go further back, who's killing the Jews? The Inquisition. Right? And what, who's running the Inquisition? Anti-Semites. They're, they're organizing a, a mass killings, forced conversions, expulsions of Jews, and they're also oppressing everybody else. All of the Christians were oppressed by, by uh, the Inquisition, the Catholics and the Protestants, and before that, the Proto-Protestants. Everybody was oppressed. Anti-Semites are a danger to everyone. The, 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 the modern West was created by a rebellion against the anti-Semitic ruling elites of, of the Western world. That's how the modern world was created. Now, you go further, further, even further back to the Roman Empire, and you find the Roman Empire committing genocide against the ancient Jews, and the Roman Empire was also enslaving everybody. You see, so this is a pattern. This is a pattern... Uh, Anti-Semitic and the Roman Empire was totalitarian, so so it's perfectly consistent, perfectly consistent. And now we have uh, Islam, uh, the the forces of radical Islam, uh, calling for another genocide, uh, preparing for another genocide, hell bent on another genocide of the Jews. And what do they want for us? They also want to oppress us. They, the, all of us non-Jews, they they consider us infidels. Uh, and uh, they, they'll start with the Jews, just like the Nazis started with the Jews. Uh, but that's not where it's going to stop. They're coming for us. So uh, we need to wake up to what's been happening in, in the West. The ruling elites of the West, the power elites of the West, have been importing uh, 
the most radical Muslims into Europe and into the U.S. Uh, and uh, the, all of these mosques that have been going up in Europe have been built by the most radical Muslim states, by Qatar and Kuwait, uh, Kuwait, I don't know how to print it, perhaps it, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, even Iran, uh, but Turkey, uh, which has had an Islamist government for a long time now. Um, so all of these mosques have been built by radical uh, uh, Muslim states, uh, the clerics in those mosques, this is not exactly a secret, have been preaching jihad against the Euro European infidels. Um, so we, our, our, our power elites have been doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing. Our relationship to Islam should be as a refuge for people like Ayan Hirsi Ali. We should be the refuge where uh, people who want to escape the slavery of the Islamic world uh, can come here into the West and, and be uh, protected by us and flourish with us in liberty and democracy. That's what that's what the relationship of the West to Islam should be, not Western academics and governments apologizing for Islam and allying with Muslim states. No, the relationship should be the kind of relationship uh, that was at least formal uh, between uh, the countries that were trapped behind the Iron Curtain and uh, the Western free world. We were a refuge for, uh, you, you know, this was happening all the time when I was a kid, the, the um, Soviet athletic stars would travel to another country in the, in the West to compete or whatever. And it was very common that one or two or maybe an entire group of them would escape. Would, they would escape their, their jailers and, and defect. We called it defect. They would defect to the West. Uh, and then they would be protected in the West and we wouldn't give them back, right? Uh, to me as a child, that was, that was incredibly powerful. It made me realize that the Soviet Union was a gigantic prison. Uh, so because he, the, the, the most celebrated people in the Soviet Union were trying to get out, the, their star athletes who were treated as heroes inside the Soviet Union, they didn't want to be in there. They wanted to be in, they wanted to be in the United States or in, in, in Western Europe, right? So... That's the relationship we should have with, with the Islamic world. We should be the refuge for the people who want to escape. Uh, and this is something that Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's been doing a tremendously good job of uh, speaking to Westerners about Islam, right? That's, that's what she's been trying to communicate because she took refuge in the West. Uh, but the West has gotten so bad that Ayan Hirsi Ali had to escape the Netherlands to the United States because radical Islamists were hunting her, her down in the Netherlands, wow. right? Because because so many uh, radical Muslims have entered Europe uh, and begun to transform Europe. So that's uh, I think that's the realization people need to need to have. They need to realize that anti-Semites, whether in Nazi form, whether in radical Muslim form, whatever form they take, the anti-Semites are bad for you. How, how can how can how can we not have learned this after World War II? It's it's just incredible. And and uh, the other side of this coin is that the Jews are good for us. There's a reason the anti-Semites in power want to kill the Jews. It's that the Jews invented liberal politics. People don't realize what they're reading when they read the Bible. The the story of the origin of Jewish law. The, the, the political context of the origin of Jewish law is a slave revolt, a slave revolution. The Israelites were slaves of Pharaoh, and they staged the revolt with the help of God and so on, according to the story, right? But the, the, the important context is they were slaves, and once they revolted and escaped Egypt into the Sinai Desert, then they received a new law. What is this new law for? Well, this is the law of the escaped slaves. The whole point of the law is to uh, make sure that people will not be oppressed again. So, of course, there is very careful, explicit protections uh, for widows and orphans and poor people. Uh, there is a very careful separation of powers. Uh, the priests cannot own land. Uh, uh, they, 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 uh, they, also, the king cannot be a priest. Uh, and so forth. So they, they separate political from religious power, from economic power. Uh, so to make it harder for people to uh, get oppressed, uh, they created the, the law creates a huge body of, of lawyers, 
uh, uh, the rabbis who, whose job is to make sure that uh, people's rights are respected. Uh, the, the Jewish movement was moving society towards the total abolition of slavery. They are the original abolitionist movement. There is a category of slavery of, of slave in Jewish law, or it's, it's, it's a bit of a mistranslation uh, because the, the so-called slaves could only be slaves for a period uh, uh, of six years on the, on the sabbatical year. They had to be freed. And even while they were they were really indentured servants, but while they were indentured servants because they were paying maybe a debt or 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 uh, expiating uh, some crime or whatever, uh, they couldn't be mistreated. And any evidence of mistreatment would immediately get them freed. There's there's a law that says if 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 you're missing a tooth because your master uh, uh, mistreated you, automatically you go free. Uh, uh, right? They could they couldn't beat you, and they and they couldn't disrespect you either uh because it, uh, the, another law says that if you if you're a slave and you run away and you take refuge in somebody else's house by law they cannot return you they have to protect you um so uh and then in the talmud the, these laws became even more compassionate so uh the, the, the talmud says that the i i believe this is condition uh it, it says that um Condition 20A, I believe. Uh, I'll, I'll check it, but I believe that's that's where the, where the, this quote comes from. Uh, they say uh, the conditions of the slave should be identical to those of the master. So if 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 it, it, you're breaking the law, if the beds, if the slave's bed is inferior to yours, if your slave's bed is inferior, if the slave is eating worse than you are, you're breaking the law. The the, the condition 20A says that the conditions of the slave have to be equal to the master's. Well, with their food. That means they're abolishing slavery. That's what it means, right? So uh, we have been under a process of increasingly effective Jewish influence for 2,500 years in the West. And what the, Jewish, what the Jews have done to the West is absolutely unbelievable. It's incredible. It's a miracle. The Jews started with the worst societies on earth. Greco-Roman societies of antiquity were absolutely the worst societies on the planet. They weren't throwing innocent people to the circus uh, to be eaten by lions for the entertainment of the ruling elite in China. They were doing that in the West. The West was the worst place on earth. It was run by a psychotic ruling class that thought it was fun to watch an innocent human being just burst in blood because a lion was digging its jaws into him or her, right? And 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 they thought it was fun to have human beings fight like 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 a cockfight of human beings fighting to the death in front of them and then cheering like animals. That was the psychotic ruling class of the West. Those those are the ruling classes that our corrupt educational system teaches us to admire. We're supposed to admire the Greeks and Romans for their for their political. I don't mind admiring them for the scientific achievements. Those are those are objective. They're they're non controversial. But they they teach us to admire them also for their political achievements. And they tell us that the Greeks and the Romans invented democracy. Bullshit. These these are the uh, societies that supposedly invented democracy in the Western narrative that people learn in school. And what they're not learning is the true story that. Western democracy is a consequence of the Jew Jewish principle, which then becomes a Judeo-Christian principle, uh, that every individual human being is equally worth in the eyes of God. That principle, that we all have equal worth in the eyes of God, is the essential principle you need to establish a modern democracy. Equality under the law. Because that's what mean what that's what makes us all voters. It's what means that it, it, it's what makes us all capable of suing each other in the courts, uh, uh, and, and so forth. That principle, equality under the eyes of God, which is the same thing as equality under the law, when this becomes politics, that comes from the Jews. Uh, uh, Rabbi Hillel the Elder, the most important rabbi in all of history, because Hillel the Elder is the origin of all of Jewish jurisprudence. So all of the uh, secondary uh, halakha, the, 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 the uh, 
uh, all of the law that was developed in response to real life situations and changing historical circumstances uh, and specific uh, cer uh, experiences that we, people were having, disputes that needed to be resolved and that required that you derive a, a specific secondary law from the Constitution, which is the Torah. All of that stuff, uh, uh, which is fundamental to uh, Jewish civilization, all of that stuff has its origin in Hillel the Elder, because the, 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 the Mishnah, is, which is the beginning of Jewish ju ju jurisprudence, starts with him. Now, he said, Hillel the Elder said, that all of Jewish civilization is based on the commandment Leviticus 19.18, which states, love your brother as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The entire, this is Hillel, the most important rabbi of all time said, look, our entire system of thought is based on this one commandment. Uh, uh, and everything else is just details about how to apply this commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the essential ingredient for democracy. Because if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, then, of course, everybody should have the vote. Of course, different identities should be tolerated. Of course, we should talk to each other gently and live in peace and try to help each other. And that's what democratic Western peoples have been trying to do uh, ever since the uh, revolutions of 1848 uh, finally uh, defeated the feudal order that had been subjugating us um, for so long, right? So, so it, 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 the future of the West, in my view, the defense of the West, uh, which, which is going on, the, the West is being defended. People should not despair. Don't despair. The West is being defended. We are defending it. The podcast revolution is evidence that the West is being defended and that we, we have a way of talking to each other now, thanks to the new technologies, even though they're trying to censor them. But, but they haven't been terribly effective uh, yet. And we have ways of talking to each other. You and I are doing it right now. Uh, and we are defending the West. And more and more people can join us. Uh, don't despair. There is still time. Uh, but we do have to work together. And, and I believe the future of the West depends on people realizing that the thing that kills the West is anti-Semitism. And uh, because the, it's the tool of totalitarianism. We saw it in World War II recently. It's so clear. It's unbelievable. We're seeing it again with radical Islam. So what people need to realize is that fighting anti-Semitism is the same thing as fighting for yourself. It's the same thing as fighting for the future of the West. It's not a gift to the Jews. You're not doing them a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. Once Westerners understand that, once they understand that fighting anti-Semitism is fighting for their own selves, for their families, for their country, for the future of their civilization, then the West will survive. But that's what we need to, that's, that's the message we need to communicate to people. Wow. That, that message is, is heard loud and clear and and like you say, it's it's pretty amazing that the golden rule is based on on that chapter, the Viricus. Yeah. And Francisco, we I think we we will need a, a round two because there's many many tangents and many many other questions that I have um, for you. We will need a part two of this conversation a hundred percent to go into more specifics into the war. But I think as a, as 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 we will get, begin to wrap up because it's been a very, it's been a masterclass, a historical masterclass, and I appreciate it. Um, also, this is a good place to stop. I mean, it, we, we ended on a, on a nice, uh, yeah. we, we, we wrapped it up. Congratulations, you did a fantastic job. Thank you, thank you. That just the, 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 the last question I have here is, of course, we, we will cover that in part two. Of course, you know, how the, the war uh, unfolds, how the war ends, but, you know, what is... The, you mentioned right now that the fight of the West, the fight in, in Israel is a fight for the West, a fight for democracy. What is, if, if, if we could just wrap up with, with, you know, with one truth that the opposing uh, party needs to, hear, needs to hear in this conversation, you know, the, the people who are waving the Palestinian flags and we, without knowing all of the context, what should okay, we so know about this? Well, the thing that I would say to them is that <clears throat> they, they, so woke, actually, I, I have to publish an, an article about this because uh, it's very important. I have it in draft form. I just have to hurry up and publish it. But uh, woke was actually created by the anti-Semites. 
and it began, woke began with an attack on Israel. It was done by Edward Said and, uh, well, even before that by uh, people like um, uh, Willie Brandt and... and uh, there, there were several important figures that um, were instrumental in turning the left against Israel. So Bruno Kreisky was the uh, Austrian chancellor, uh, and there's all kinds of evidence to show that Bruno Kreisky, although he called himself a Jew, he, Bruno Kreisky was actually an anti-Semite. Uh, and so he invited uh, Arafat over f for a big conference, and um, uh, it was not just him. Uh, as I said, the, the German chancellor also showed up, and they had this big thing where they, they declared that the, the, the PLO was fighting for leftist goal. So they dressed up the PLO in leftist garb. Uh, and uh, then people like Edward Said and, and, and others uh, uh, pushed this as well. And this is where the thing began to turn because they... they the, the push from these leaders of the international left was so strong. Uh, there was so much media support for what they were doing and academic support in the universities for what they were doing that people ended up convinced that the Palestinians were fighting an anti-colonial fight. Okay? So, so Israel, which was born as the refuge for the victims of European imperialism, right? The, the biggest victims of European imperialism were the Jews. Uh, the Jews were murdered en masse in Europe in, in World War II. Uh, so the biggest victims of the European power elite, the Western power elite, took refuge in the state of Israel. They created a state to protect themselves from persecution. So the, in, in that original narrative, which is the correct narrative, the Jews are the underdog. They're, they're seeking to escape. And that narrative held for a few years after the war, after the creation of the state of Israel. I remember this. When I was a child in the 1970s uh, in Mexico, the adults around me were all admirers of Israel. Catholics, but they were admirers of Israel because... They could, they, the, the, his, the memory of World War II was still fresh enough. And they could see that the Arab states were banding together to try to destroy Israel and repeat the genocide there. Uh, so um, when Israel won its wars against all the combined Arab states, uh, the adults around me would say things like, you know, the Israelis are tremendous. It's wow. I mean, that's, they've, it's incredible what they've done and blah, blah, blah. And it, all words of admiration. And the framing for all of that was, you know, these guys who barely, who, who are barely alive because the Nazis tried to kill them all, uh, are, are doing a miracle in the Middle East. And, and the abs keep trying to kill them and, and they keep winning the wars and they've got a thriving state and all of this. And wow, pure admiration. Israel was the underdog, right? And if there's something that's, fundamental to left left identity the left can be transformed into many things but the thing it will never abandon is the claim to be fighting for the underdog that's what defines the le the self-identity of the left right whether it's true or not that's the label they always put on themselves that's what identifies them as leftists it's the the only the only thing that is consistent across all people who label themselves as leftists is that they, they claim to be fighting for the underdog. So what they did in the 1970s is that they turned the Palestinians into the underdog. That's what they did. That's what they did with the media system. So they, they portrayed the Israelis as oppressors of the Palestinians, which is completely false. What, so you ask me, what would be the message to the people who are now defending Hamas? Mm -hmm. The message is, if you, if you really think the Palestinians are the underdog, and there is a sense in which they are, the, the, there's no question that the Arab Palestinians are suffering oppression, but the people oppressing them, as always, are the anti-Semites. 
Those are the oppressors. Hamas is a terrorist, totalitarian organization. People talk about Israel is hitting uh, civilian tar targets in Gaza. There are no civilian targets in Gaza. Gaza is itself a terrorist military structure because it is governed by Hamas, that is a terrorist military organization, and Hamas has put its, its terrorist military infrastructure all over Gaza. Their headquarters are in a hospital. There is no civilian is infrastructure in Gaza. That's a media myth. It's designed to make it impossible for people to think. There is no civilian infrastructure in Gaza. The, entire, the Hamas is all, all they're, they've, they're all over the tunnels of Gaza. The entire tunnel, all underneath Gaza, they're all over. Their military hardware and, and communication systems, it's all over. So Gaza is really a military, a militarized state. It's a, it's a gigantic military terrorist infrastructure that is camouflaged with structures that the media then gets to call civilian infrastructures so that Israel can be accused every time it responds to Hamas's attacks. But Israel does everything it can to avoid civilian casualties. Israel sends, uh, you know, millions of emails and makes thousands of phone calls and drops billions of little papers, uh, t uh, leaflets to telling people to uh, uh, evacuate before they do an operation, which of course destroys their element of surprise, right? So this is, who's oppressing the Gaza Palestinians? Hamas is oppressing the Gaza Palestinians because Hamas is hell bent on a genocidal war and it needs the Gaza Palestinians completely subdued and uh, supportive of that genocidal war, uh, which requires that they be completely oppressed and indoctrinated. So uh, Hamas controls the media system and the educational system. And whoever disagrees with Hamas, they don't even have to say that they're in favor of Israel. They just have to disagree with Hamas on anything. And they will immediately be uh, considered Israeli collaborators and people will knock on their door and, and murder them and their families. This has been going on. For... Hajamina Husseini was doing this in the early 20th century. The, the local... Uh, Arabs in British Mandate Palestine didn't want to go out and kill Jews because they were flourishing with the economic boom that the Zionists were producing. That's why there was so much Arab Muslim immigration into Palestine at the same time that the Zionist Jews were coming because they created an economic boom and they didn't want to fight the Jews. Why would they want to fight the Jews? The, 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 the Jewish Im Zionist immigration to British Mandate Palestine was freeing the Arabs. The situation that they had there was feudal. They had these um, uh, uh, feudal lords, the Effendi, uh, 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 the, the, the Ayan uh, status was the, the highest class of the Effendi. And these were feudal lords, uh, uh, like in the Middle Ages in Europe. And, and, and the peons, the, the, the peasants were basically slaves. They were debt slaves because they uh, couldn't get out of their debts with these feudal lords. So when the Zionists came in and started buying up the land because they bought it, they bought it from uh, 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 Arab landowners who had title and wanted to sell. Nobody, nobody it took land away by force from anyone. That that those the, well, actually, Husseini did uh, from from some Arabs, but the Jews didn't. Uh, and what Husseini was doing is he was uh, threatening the small Arab landowners if they dared sell land to the Jews who were paying a lot of money for the land. So it was a good opportunity for these small smallholders. Uh, but if anybody dared sell land to the Jews, Husseini and his terrorists would go, would go to them, kill them, kill their families. So everybody learned that you, you, if you were a small land landowner, you wouldn't sell money, you wouldn't sell land to the Jews because you would get killed. So Husseini would then go and, and tell these same smallholders, he would say, "Look, I'll buy it, I'll buy it, but sell it to me." But of course, they had a gun to their heads, so so the price was um, a, 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 a price, an extortion price very, very low. Uh, so he bought all that land on the cheap. And, and he, Hussein, he was a member of one of the biggest landholding Arab families, would consolidate these lands that he would buy from the smallholders. And then he would say it, sell them through a cousin to the Jewish agency. And then he would use the money that the Jewish agency was paying for those lands to organize the terrorist movement against Jewish civilians. But because the Arabs, ordinary Arabs, mostly didn't want to participate in that violence, 
I'll give you just one statistic. It's an eloquent statistic in the Arab revolt that goes from 1936 to 1939, which was an incredible amount of mayhem uh, and terrorist violence directed <clears throat> against Jewish civilians. Haj Amir al-Husseini's forces, oh, by the way, the, the, uh, that Arab revolt was carried out with arms sent by Mussolini and Hitler, right? Uh, in the Arab revolt, Husseini managed to kill 400 Jews. You know how many Arabs he killed? More than 2,000. More than 2,000. So Husseini was killing more fellow Arabs than he was killing Jews. Why? Because these people didn't want to kill Jews. Not yet. They hadn't been indoctrinated by decades of poison in their schools yet. They had just immigrated there. And, they, and, and some of them had been peons in the uh, uh, feudal estates of the... Uh, Arab power elite, uh, and they were finding new opportunities. The, 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 the Zionist Jews coming into the British Mandate in Palestine were mostly Marxists, whose ideology was we have to be solidary with the Arab worker. That's what they believed. So they were welcoming these Arab workers into their kibbutzim to, as, as laborers and in their industries as laborers. And they, these Arab workers were doing way better than they had done as semi slave peasants of the uh, Arab landowning class, right? So this whole idea that the Jews came to destroy Arab-Palestinian life, it's just nonsense. The best thing that ever happened to those Arabs is that the Jews arrived uh, in, in, in big numbers to create a Jewish state. And you can see it today. The, the Arab Muslims that have rights in the Middle East, the ones that can vote, that can have access to the legal system, that can elect the representatives uh, to the parliament. Uh, those are the, the Arab Palestinians who live in Israel. They even have a member of the Supreme Court who's an Arab Palestinian. And uh, if they want to serve in the army, they can serve in the army. The, 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 the Muslims who are slaves, the, the ones who should be the uh, center of protest movements in the West, are the Muslims who live in Muslim states and also the slaves of the Muslims because in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, 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 Kuwait, all of these countries, they're full of slaves. People don't know this, but there are actual formal slaves, people who immigrate there, you know, from the Philippines and, and, and uh, other parts of uh, uh, Southeast Asia and so forth, who looking for a job and they're promised jobs in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and so forth. So they go there uh, thinking, you know, this is an opportunity. And when they get there, they take their passports away and they can never leave again. They become actual slaves with a master uh, in a home, in an Arab Muslim home. There's a huge population of slaves in these countries. You don't see the woke people uh, marching in the streets to free those people. Uh, why not? And I think the, the answer is, going back to the, the question, is that the, the, what we now call woke the anti-colonialism and all that uh, nonsense. Um, that was, it, 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 that movement made it a litmus test that you are not a good person, not a good leftist, unless you are supporting the Arab-Palestinian people. That's, uh, in, which in, in the end means supporting the terrorist organizations that, uh, that claim to represent them, right? So if you don't do this, you're not a good leftist. It's a litmus test. It's a flag. It's a, it's an identity mechanism. It's like a secret handshake. So if, if uh, and it doesn't matter what other positions you take, if you're not supporting uh, uh, Pilo Fatah uh, and, and Hamas, uh, if you're not supporting the Palestinian struggle, as they call it, uh, then you're just not a member in good standing of that community. Uh, and people don't want to be expelled by their own tribe. So uh, this 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 is the glue that has kept this movement together and 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 growing because people want to signal their virtue. That this 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 um, v virtue signaling term is actually quite useful. Uh, the the grammar of the left requires you all the time to be signaling your virtue. How do you signal your? What is the most important virtue signal? The most important virtue signal is you oppose Israel. Israel is the bad guy. That's the most important virtue signal for leftists today. And what that means is that they've been poisoned by the Nazis. They've been poisoned by the eugenicists. They've been poisoned by the system that is promoting radical Islam against uh, the Jewish state because it's trying once again to sink the entire West 
into a totalitarian equilibrium. And if they succeed, uh, we may never get out of that hole uh, because the world has changed. Uh, we are in a, 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 I think it's, it's possible for them now to produce a permanent uh, right-wing totalitarian nightmare. Uh, so leftists should be worried about that. <laughs> That's what they should be worried about. And uh, uh, so that would be my message. If you were worried, if, if you were an honest defender of the Arab Palestinians, you should be an opponent of Hamas because Hamas is killing the Arab Palestinian children. This is the, the article I just published. The UN is allied with Hamas and is allied with Pilo Fatah and they are killing the Arab Palestinian children. They, they destroy their minds in the schools. When they're very young, they start teaching them that the thing that they have to aspire to is genocide, that the, that the best thing they can do as adults when they grow up or even as children is to die as a shaheed, as a, a quote-unquote martyr uh, for the Islamic cause uh, to destroy the Jewish people, right? That's what they tell them. This is the poison that they put in their minds from a very early age. And they use them as suicide bombers. They use children as human shields, right? So if, if I think it is correct to defend the Arab Palestinians. I do believe that. I'm not saying we shouldn't defend them. We should defend them. They are being oppressed, but they're not being oppressed by Israel. They're being oppressed by Hamas. They're being oppressed by Pilo Fatah, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah. All of these groups are oppressing Arabs. Uh, the government of Saudi Arabia, the government of Qatar, uh, all of these, the government of Iran, those are the oppressors of Arabs. And we should def the West should be a refuge for uh, the people who want to escape the clutches of Islam, just like the West was a refuge for the people who wanted to escape the clutches of communism. That is the proper relationship of the free West to these other systems. And uh, if they really want to be good people, instead of signaling their virtue and pretending to be good people, which is what they're doing right now, then they really need to start defending the Arab Palestinians. Uh, and that means supporting Israel's uh, effort to defeat those organizations. Ooh, Francisco, there's a, even though we've run, run almost two hours, there's a lot to be said still. There's we can do another one. We will do another round, of absolutely, yeah. and we will cover another some, so many more themes. And thank you for this masterclass. I will have to re-listen to this a couple more times because... I got caught up in the overwhelming uh, ideas that you were sharing. They're, they're quite overwhelming. And like you say, if more people were aware of, of some of the truths that you were sharing with us right now, the conversation would be different. And I'm glad to have hosted you to, to share those truths. And so I'm hoping for a next round. And, and again, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I'll just leave your audience with uh, one last recommendation. Don't believe anything I said. Go check it. Uh, and if I got anything wrong, Uh, I'm quite, quite happy to hear about it. Uh, people can com communicate with me through my Substack or through my website, uh, managementofreality.com. Uh, that, that's also the name of my YouTube channel, but people can interact with me there. And if there's anything I got wrong, just the other day, one, one of my longtime uh, readers pointed out a, a fact, a minor fact, but one that I should correct anyway. Uh, and this happens all the time. I get things wrong. Um, so... Don't go, don't go believe in anything I said, go check it. And let's start all of us flexing our critical thinking muscles uh, and together as a community, criticize each other, find the errors in the models we are building, help each other uh, refine those models. Uh, the, the, the more predictive they become, obviously the better they are, uh, uh, the more data they explain, the more paradoxes uh, that they make vanish. Uh, obviously, the better our models are becoming, and that's what we need to do. We need to build models uh, doing our own work instead of just uh, accepting what the media and the educational system have been force-feeding us. A hundred percent, and I will add all of your information in the show notes so people can reach sure. out, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Alex.